Hey guys, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, perfect. Uh, we were kind of just waiting on a couple people to come back into the room. Um, we'll start in like a minute. Uh, if you guys in the meanwhile can kind of look at the images that are up and give your best guess if you want in the in the chat of uh, watch each di which what is each diagnosis? What is the diagnosis for each picture? Oh, four different patients, four different diagnoses. 
just for like the interest of time, we'll go ahead and start. Um, today, oops, wait, there we go. Um, so our objectives today, we're gonna define and classify diffuse cystic lung disease. We're gonna talk about the mechanism of pulmonary cyst formation. We're gonna talk about radiological evaluation of pulmonary cysts. And then we're gonna go through a very case-based presentation of some differentials in diffuse cystic lung disease. So first we have to kind of define what we're looking at. And um, diffuse cystic lung diseases are a heterogeneous group of processes that are characterized by the presence of multiple spherical or irregularly shaped thin walled air fill, uh, air fill spaces within the pulmonary parenchyma. Now the mechanism of uh, their formation isn't completely understood for all of these processes, but in general, there is some kind of infiltrative or inflammatory process that results in some degree of lung remodeling. Now this table is a bit busy, um, but I think it's important when you're kind of looking at images and generating your differentials, if you have some large groups uh, in your mind that you could then kind of fill in your fill in for. So neoplastic, primary, as well as metastatic, you need to consider genetic, um, or developmental disorders. Our most common would be Bray-Hogdebe as well as LAM. Those associated with lymphoproliferative disorders, you're gonna think about LIP, lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia and follicular bronchiolitis, which kind of exist on a spectrum. We'll discuss that a little later. Um, there's amyloidosis, light chain deposition, deposition disease. Your infectious etiologies like PCP, I think, is probably the most common one that will come to mind for us. Those associated with ILD, so hypersensitivity pneumonitis, IPF, your smoking related causes, so pulmonary lung or hand cell, cell histiocytosis, uh, DIP or descommutative interstitial pneumonia, and respiratory bronchiolitis as well. And it's important for the bottom ones, particularly uh, those processes that can mimic diffuse cystic lung disease. So emphysema is a big one, um, honeycombing in your um, ILD cases and your IPF cases. Um, and we'll go through some images to help us better understand this. So, sorry, I'm like claustrophobic with the mess. Um, so our mechanisms of pulmonary cyst formation. So again, it's not very well understood, but there are three main mechanisms that are proposed. So the first is that you have this one way obstruction um, of airflow in your small airways. So air enters, but it can't empty. So you get this balloon dilation in your distal spaces, distal air spaces. And it's thought to be the process um, uh, of cyst formation in follicular bronchiolitis, as well as in metastases. Your second mechanism or theory um, would be ischemia. So in this case, you have infiltration as well as obstruction of your small vessels and capillaries that supply your terminal bronchioles. And um, the, this then leads to necrosis and ischemic dilation of your small airways and your alveoli. And then that progresses to cyst formation. And this is thought to be one of the main mechanisms in PLCH, pulmonary Langerhans cell, cell histiocytosis. Your third mechanism is remodeling that occurs by matrix degrading enzymes, the most common one being your matrix metalloproteinases. There are other proteases that are involved as well, but essentially there is connective tissue degradation and elastolysis, and that eventually leads to cis formation. And that's thought to be the process in, in um, LAM as well as to some degree in PLCH. So before we can kind of talk about cystic lung disease, we have to be able to adequately identify a cyst on radiographs. And we have to be able to know the difference between the different mimickers of a cyst on imaging. So for it to be a cyst, a true cyst, there should be an epithelial cell lining. And so our first diagram, A, will show you a thin wall cyst with um, a th thin wall area with a spherical parenchymal lucency that interfaces with normal lung. Now that's compared to figure B where you could see a cavity. So an airflow space with some degree of consolidation or mass surrounding it. And it's typically more thicker walled and more irregularly shaped than a cyst. 
Then we have our bola in um, figure C. So these appear as spherical focal lucencies greater than a centimeter in diameter. They're bounded by a thin wall. Um, and usually they're accompanied with some degree of emphysema on the imaging as well. Your bleb, somewhat similar. I don't have a diagram of that, but it's a cystic airspace bounded by a thin wall adjacent to the visceral pleura, and it's typically less than one centimeter in size. For your last one, your nematocele, um, these are round, thin-walled airfill spaces in the lung that most frequently occur due to infection, sometimes also with uh, trauma or aspiration. So this um, kind of flowchart or algorithm um, goes over how most radiologists would approach imaging. Um, so the first thing they're gonna say is step one, is this actually a lung cyst? If it's not a lung cyst, then you're looking for mimickers. Your mimickers would be a cavitary lesion, bulla, pneumatocele, emphysema, honeycombing, cystic bronchiectasis. And if those aren't present and you are fairly confident that this is a lung cyst, then you're gonna start thinking, is this cyst solitary and localized or is it multiple and diffuse? If it is a solitary localized cyst, you're gonna start thinking, is this a congenital etiology or is it an incidental cyst? If it's multiple and diffusely distributed, then you're gonna start looking for other radiological findings that could help with your differential diagnosis. So if there's nothing else but just cyst on your imaging, you're gonna think about LAM and BHD, BHD being Bird hog debate. If there are other findings, you're gonna to try to see what are those findings. So if you see some central lobular nodules, you might start thinking this might be PLCH, cystic metastases or amyloidosis. Versus if you see a prominence of ground glass opacities, you're gonna think about PCP, DIP and LIP. Now, that brings us to our first case. So this is a 31 year old female. She has an insidious onset of dyspnea with her CT scan abnormalities is shown here. And she had a lung biopsy with findings shown here. So which of the following would most likely confirm your suspicions? A, a tissue stain for S100 protein antibodies. B, measurement of alpha one antitrypsin level. C, a tissue stain for a CD1A antibody, or D, a tissue stain for HMB45 antibody. Sorry? B? E? D? E? Anybody else? And you guys can uh, talk in the chat too, like you could put in your answer if you have a, a suggestion. So why, why do you think it's it's D? Like, what's your diagnosis? Yeah, awesome, right. So uh, this is a patient that has LAM. Um, and why do we think she has LAM? So if you look at her imaging, she has diffuse distribution of thin wall cysts. And I hope you guys have seen my point and I'm not pointing in vain. Um, and then on the histology, um, so you see she has this large cystic space, and then she has these smooth muscle-like cells, which are actually LAM cells. Um, and if you were to stain these which, with HMB45, they would be positive. Um, your S100, does anybody know what that stain is for? What? Yeah. And CD1A also is for Langerhans, right? And then your alpha-1 antitrypsin level would be if you're thinking of a mimica, right? So like if you, she had emphysematous changes, then maybe that might be something we'd consider. So let's talk about LAM. So uh, the prevalence of LAM is probably underreported. Um, it's probably much higher, but uh, for all intents and purposes, 3.4 to 7.8 per million women. Um, exclusively occurring in women usually of childbearing age and generally presents with either a spontaneous pneumothorax or some degree of dyspnea, progressive dyspnea. Um, lung, lung decline or func decline in lung function in LAM really occurs because you have these smooth muscle-like cells, which are like the LAM cells, that become dysregulated. They infiltrate the lung, they disrupt lymphatics, and they eventually lead to 
destruction of the parenchyma, and that's how you get cysts forming. So there are two basic presentations of LAM. There's SLAM, which is kind of your sporadic um, somatic mutation, and there's TSC LAM. So TSC is tuberous sclerosis, sclerosis complex. Um, and this is due to autosomal dominant inheritance, and there's a germline mutation in TSC1 or TSC2. It's really important in these patients that you take a really good history, a family history in particular, and a really good physical exam, because you can find that they have these hypomelanotic macules, they can have... Uh, they could have facial angiofibromas, they can have these chagrin patches, and they can have periungal fibromas. When, we when it comes to investigating these patients, your money is going to be on your high resolution CT. You're going to see these thin wall diffuse distribution of cysts. And when you do get histology on these patients, um, Again, like in the other patients, so you'll see the large cystic space, but then you'll also see um, these like ag focal kind of aggregates of either spindle cells or epithelioid LAM cells. And when you stain them with HMB45, they'll have these brown kind of deposit kind of areas, and that's how you'll know it's positive. Um, if you were to get a PET CT in this patient, so let's say you were thinking um, your differentials were like, uh, neoplastic process, it's important to know that LAM is PET negative. So if you're thinking this person might have a neoplastic process, that might be a good tool for you um, to kind of move forward with. There's serum VEG FD levels. So um, vascular endothelial growth factor D is actually highly specific and sensitive for patients with LAM. So if you have a value greater than 800 picograms per mil, that that you can say this is LAM. Of course, in the presence of the other characteristics, the, the high resolution CT characteristics we talked about. How do we manage these patients? So there is one very large trial that comes across. Um, it's called the MILES trial. It's a multi-center international LAM efficacy of serolimus trial. So this is a double-blinded, um, randomized, parallel group trial. And for one year, they followed, they, the intervention was either you got serolimus versus placebo for one year, and then they followed the patients for one year after, observed them. So your inclusion criteria, you had to have a definitive diagnosis of LAM, um, and you also had to have an FEV1 that was less than 70%. Now, what they found was in the following year where they observed them, those that had the placebo actually lost approximately 10% of their lung function over the course of that year, versus the patients who got serolimus, they actually had stable lung function, they had improved quality of life scores, improved functional performance, and they also had lower um, levels of VEGFD. And so there is this population of patients with LAM who have a FEV1 less than 70% that it's recommended for use. However, there's no data to tell you how long should this medication be used for. Because really what you find is that there's a suppressive effect, but it doesn't actually induce remission in these patients. So continuing the medication is solely up to the provider that's kind of prescribed it essentially. Um, if you saw that they had um, obstruction on PFPs, you'd offer them a bronchodilator. Pleurodesis is really important um, to consider in these patients once they've presented to you with a pneumothorax because the rate of recurrence is greater than 70%. Um, and they do have additional extrapulmonary manifestations, particularly when they have angiolipomas that are greater than four centimeters, you should really refer them for, for um, treatment. And if having treated them the best you could with serolimus, bronchodilators, and they continue to have a decline in FEV1, you can refer them for um, lung transplant evaluation. So that brings us to case two. Case two is a 32-year-old female with a history of asthma. She came to the ED for evaluation of an abnormal CT. So she has one year history of worsening dyspnea. She has a productive cough and she's a current tobacco user. She previously was employed as a smog technician. 
physical exam shows decrease your entry bilaterally. She has some labs at Andy and one in 80. And then she gets this imaging. So which of the following is the best initial treatment for this patient? Smoking cessation, corticosteroids, antibiotics, profenadone. What do you guys want, want to do? So that's the obvious answer, I feel. So what, why is that the answer? What's the diagnosis? A young female, look at her imaging. So she has um, this kind of like cystic distribution that is mostly upper lobe, maybe a little middle lobe predominant, and she's sparing of the costophrenic angles. And it's a female smoker. What do we think? And I tell you, like, she quit smoking and, like, her lung function just totally improves. Like, she's good as gold. So she has a pulmonary langer hand, so all his geocytosis. Okay? Uh, so we'll kind of go through that next. So um, this occurs because of a somatic mutation, most commonly involving um, BRAF, but sometimes MAP2K1. Um, Patients generally present with respiratory symptoms, plus or minus constitutional symptoms, and almost exclusively they have, in fact, exclusively, they have a significant smoking history. Um, they can present with extra pulmonary manifestations. Um, most commonly, they present, they present with a pneumothorax, but the other things you would look for would be central diabetes insipidus, cutaneous, and osteolytic lesions. And the cutaneous and osteolytic lesions are helpful because you may not need, if you're needing a tissue diagnosis in this patient, they may not have to go through a, a bronch to get a TBBX or even a surgical lung biopsy if you can biopsy somewhere else. Um, so when you look at high resolution CT for these patients, uh, figures A through C are kind of like the early stage of disease and figures D through F are as things progress and you get more advanced. So you will see these variable sizes, kind of bizarrely, irregularly shaped. Um, and as the, they're generally in the upper to mid zones in terms of distribution. And as the disease progresses, you will see that they also have some associated micro or macro nodules. And those nodules in advanced disease can actually cavitate um, along with having some areas of reticulation. So when you get histology on these patients, you're going to see um, you're going to see that they have uh, these initial kind of cystic spaces um, with yeah um, these initial cystic spaces with the what we describe as like the longer hand cells around them. And when you stain with CD1A, um, they stain positively and they have these like brown deposits that you see. Now, as they get more advanced in disease, you'll see still the cystic space, but then you see this area of like posicella stellate fibrosis. And you can also see that they get these like smoking related pigmented macrophages. It's kind of like brown kind of area here. Um, so most importantly, and what kind of comes across on like board questions is that the S100 and CD1A positive, that's their immunohistochemical stains that are used. Um, and last but not least, you could pursue genetic testing for a BRAF mutation in these patients. So you definitely advise them to quit smoking because quitting smoking can stabilize them, but it also in some cases can cause actual like regression and resolution in some of these patients. Now, who do you consider pursuing pharmacotherapy for? These are the people who have successfully quit smoking and despite that on serial PFTs show continuing decline in FEV1. Um, there's not a ton of data to support all of these, to be honest. The, um, what exists is probably the best data exists for cladribine. Um, so that might be an option, but when I say best data, it's still like case series or like very small retrospective, nothing that I would like bet my life on. Um, the BRAF inhibitor is a little newer um, as kind of gene therapy and precision medicine becomes more popular. They're kind of looking into it. I don't think this is on the market yet. Um, 
And then the other things you wanna look at are disease specific complications. So you wanna treat if they have a pneumothorax, consider pleurodesis. If they have respiratory failure, obviously let them give them some oxygen. Um, you wanna address if they might present with central diabetes insipidus. And you also wanna monitor for development of pulmonary hypertension. And if appropriate, despite all of your interventions, they continue to decline, then you wanna um, refer them for a lung transplant eval. So that brings us to case three. K3 is a 38-year-old female. She's a non-smoker. She had a prior left spontaneous pneumothorax that got treated with surgical resection and pleurodesis. She now has this new onset cough and breathlessness. She comes to the ED and she has this presyncopal ep episode with some hypotension. She gets imaging and she gets emergent treatment for this imaging. During her prior evaluation, so you're looking back in her record, she had a serum VEGFD level that was normal. And she also had histological evaluation and there were no um, characteristic features for LAM or PLCH. So her HMB45 and CD1A were both negative. Now, full analysis of which gene would delineate her underlying diagnosis. somebody said the answer. Yeah. Okay, so uh, B it is. So why is it B? What's the diagnosis? Yes, Bert how do be. Um, so just to, I think we, because we kind of just went over BRAF, we know would be um, PLCH. We know that TSC2 would be LAM. CFTR would be seen in cystic fibrosis. So FLCN codes for the folliculin gene. It's a tumor suppressor gene that is um, responsible for uh, mutation that causes Berthog Dubé. So Berthog Dubé. Um, oh, and one thing about the folliculin gene is that it's expressed in skin, kidneys, and um, oh, and the lung. So that's where. <laughs> So, so that's why when you go through kind of the history of these patients, like that's where the disease process manifests for them. Um, so patients, these patients have a prevalence of pneumothorax that's about 24%, and most of them will present to you with a pneumo around the age of 38, and their rate of recurrence is very high at 75%. When it comes to your extra pulmonary manifestations, um, I think the next slide has a picture of a fibric, fibrofolliculoma, but on this slide, you can see these like white papilla areas. Those are tr trichodiscomas. Um, and this is another disease where you really want to elicit a very good family history. So in terms of, so this would be the um, fibrofolliculoma I was just mentioning. So on these patients, again, your high resolution, high resolution CT will be um, really helpful. And what you'll find is that they have more elliptical or lentiform shaped cysts, thin walled, and their distribution can be basal, peripheral, or subplural. Uh, they frequently have um, cysts that abut the pleura and have like proximal vessels near them. And when you get histology, um, you will see this interparenchymal cystic area with this um, intracystic septum is kind of like what they call it. Um, and when you look at the rest of the slide, there'll be no surrounding like abnormal uh, fiber inflammatory changes at all. Now, in these patients, it also would be more helpful for you to get if they have skin lesions, do punch biopsies. It'll give you your diagnosis fairly easily. Um, and then genetic testing for the filiclin mutation also. So what's our management? So again, pneumothorax is the biggest issue, with, well, one of the two biggest issues with these patients. So you wanna offer them pleurodesis earlier than later. And then in terms of renal cell cancer, this is the most threatening manifestation of red hog debate. So up, up to about a third of these patients present with a renal cell cancer at the age of 50. Um, so you wanna start screening them by the time they turn 20, and then you wanna repeat those images every three years. Case four. So this is a 61-year-old female. She has long-standing Sjogren's syndrome, and she has biopsy-proven LIP. Um, that has been serially evaluated because of the presence of multiple pulmonary nodules. She has undergone repeated lung biopsies. All specimens have been suggestive of LIP. 
And she describes new onset non-productive cough, severe fatigue, night sweats, she has high grade fevers in the last one month. She gets a chest X-ray um, followed by CT imaging here. So this is her older stuff. So she gets chest X-ray and followed by CT imaging. A surgical lung biopsy gets performed and she's diagnosed with diffuse large B-cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Which of the following best characterizes pulmonary involvement complicating primary Sjogren's syndrome and LIP? So A, ILD in Sjogren's is rarely progressive. B, the most common ILD in primary Sjogren's is LIP. C, cystic lung disease rarely occurs in LIP. Or D, the most common lymphomas associated with LIP are well-differentiated and slow-growing mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue lymphomas. What was the answer? D as in dog or B as in bat? Which one? B as in boy? And anybody else? Any other suggestions? <laughs> okay. Um, so answer is D. <laughs> Um, so I so ILD is the most common pulmonary manifestation in Sjogren's, and LIP lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia is one form of ILD in Sjogren's. Now, in terms of like the options, so ILD in um, Sjogren's is actually can be very severe and progressive. So not it. The most common ILD in primary Sjogren's is actually NSIP. Um, and cystic lung disease actually occurs in about up to 80, 80% of patients with LIP. Um, so D is your answer because about 5% of patients actually of, with LIP actually can progress to lymphoma. Because um, LIP really is a, just a benign polyclonal disorder where you have mature B or T cells that can either diffusely involve the lung or have very focal areas of lung involvement. So we'll talk about LIP and FB, follicular bronchi bronchitis. So they kind of exist on a spectrum or a continuum rather um, of lymphocytic infiltration from hyperplasia of your bronchus associated lymphoid tissue, which is kind of like more your FB, to cellular expansion of your interstitium with fibrosis, which is more of like your LIP. Um, in terms of the etiology, you're, for these patients, you're going to probably do a very extensive workup because you want to really figure out what the underlying cause as, is, as that's really your primary treatment for them. So you're going to consider Sjogren's, RA, SLE, um, any other immunodeficiency states, particularly HIV or CVID. Um, and among the connective tissue disorders, Sjogren's is most commonly associated with LIP and FB. Oh, sorry, wrong direction. So in terms of your, in terms of your, oh, someone's in the chat. I don't know how to get to you. It doesn't show up on my thing. Oh, not what I wanted to do, sorry. Let the boss handle this. It's okay. Thank you for your participation. <laughs> um, so in these patients, again, your high resolution CT is going to be very helpful. So for LIP and FB, you're going to be looking for things other than just the cyst to help you kind of confirm your differential diagnosis. So you will commonly see that they also have areas of ground glass attenuation. They can have poorly defined central lobular nodules. Um, they can have interlobular septal thickening. And um, sometimes they also have these like borders of eccentric vessels. When you look at the histopathology for these patients, um, what you'll see is that they have these parenchymal cysts, 
where your asterisk is. And then they have these associated areas of follicular lymphoid hyperplasia, and there's us they're usually centered around a bronchiole. And so similar situation here, you also have the follicular hyperplasia, and this is like your bronchiole here. Now, biopsy in these patients or tissue in these patients is really important because you want to exclude the presence of a low-grade malignant lymphoproliferative disorder, the most common being malt lymphomas. So your management is really going to be based on your underlying etiology, whatever that autoimmune or, immu or immunodeficient state is, that's really what you want to target for these patients. Um, and again, just with these patients, especially those that have Strogan syndrome, you really want to be vigilant for them developing um, a lymphoproliferative um, like disorder like malt lymphoma. So now we're going to kind of, we did the four main, four main cystic disease differentials, and now we're going to breeze through some of the others with what time we have left. Um, so amyloidosis. So this occurs because you have this extracellular deposition of proteins in an abnormal fibrillary fashion, and it can be diffuse or systemic versus like localized. And so when patients have localized pulmonary amyloidosis, they tend to have um, multiple pulmonary nodules that can cavitate, and some subset of them will present with cystic lung disease as shown in the imaging. Um, when you get histopath on these patients, you are gonna see that they have these uh, intraparenchymal cystic areas, and then you'll have amyloid de uh, deposits also that you'll see. And when you use uh, staining on them, so you, um, you'll, when you use a Congo red stain, sorry, um, you'll see that they exhibit this apple green bifurinates. Next, we'll look at light chain disease. So light chain disease, your big distinguisher between that and amyloid is that it just does not bind Congo red. Um, it does have some associated extra pulmonary manifestations that you could look for. So lymphoproliferative disorders and renal failure are kind of the top ones. Um, the cysts that form in light chain disease is thought to be most commonly due to your matrix degrading enzymes. So your matrix metalloproteinase is probably the most, it, well, it is the um, most common reason for connective tissue destruction. And when you do a high resolution CT in these patients, you're gonna see multiple small, generally less than two centimeter round cysts with a diffuse distribution um, that can mimic LAM. But on the other hand, you can also see these large cystic spaces with reticular nodular opacities that can mimic PLCH. So it's kind of can go either way and you just have to be a little vigilant with um, like chain disease. And on your histology, which is kind of like where your money is for the diagnosis, you're going to get these monotypic kappa light chain de deposition in your alveolar walls, your small airways, and your vessels. Um, and managing these patients, so the big things to remember is whatever their underlying hematological disease is, that's where you're going to target. Um, they do have a pr pr propensity to progress to respiratory failure. And if given all of the all of the available treatments or indicated treatments, if they continue to progress with decline in lung function, then you will you can refer them for transplant evaluation. Malignancy, so lots of malignancies, uh, primary as well as metastatic, and we're not going to go through these, but just for you to have an awareness that all of these can present with cystic disease on imaging. I think the biggest one would be lymphoma for us smoking related diffuse cystic lung diseases. So um, your two biggest would be RB and DIP. Um, and for RB, you really have this kind of bronchial metaplasia and the accumulation of these pigmented macrophages and distal airways. DIP is similar, but there is just profuse intra-alveolar accumulation of the pigmented macrophages. Radiographically, again, they're quite similar. You'll see bronchial wall thickening, centrilobular nodules, ground glass attenuation. But with DIP, um, the cystic changes 
are typically more lower lung zone predominant. And it involves less than 10% of the parenchyma and often again, we'll have that brown glass attenuation surrounding it. Um, in terms of your management, so again, you're gonna really counsel them please quit smoking. Um, there is some evidence, though limited, for the use of like steroids and immunosuppressive agents, um, but there's no kind of guidelines for that. Infection. So the biggest one that I think we all probably have seen is PCP. Um, usually we see they have bilateral ground glass opacities, they have areas of reticulation, but there is a percentage of these patients that can present with pneumothorax and cystic lung disease. Um, in this case, the cysts are generally bilateral, diffusely distributed, tend to be more upper zone, um, upper zone predominant. Um, and the cysts themselves can have virial size, variable size and wall thickness. Um, for your diagnosis, you're going to identify the fungal organism, which is kind of seen on this. These are images of, um, from a BAL. And when you stain with GMS, you can actually see the fungal organism. And that's kind of how you make your diagnosis. Um, for, in terms of treatment, when you actually treat PCP, the cyst can shrink and even completely resolve. So it's really important for you to be able to make this diagnosis as, as the cause of the cystic lung disease. Recurrent respiratory papillomatosis. So this really occurs in kids. Um, it's caused by HPV. And most common, the most common site um, that's affected is the larynx. However, it can have bronchopulmonary spread and you can have, um, Papillomatomas. You can have pop, you know what I mean. Um, it is seen in these areas and can result in cystic lung disease. So, what you will see on imaging will be these multiple cavities, thin wall cysts, and generally lower zone predominant nodules as well. The cysts themselves have an irregular shape. Um, and they can contain air fluid levels. Now, cysts can increase in size and number as the disease progresses without any treatment or management. Um, there are some cases where patients are treated with sodafovir and there's actually improvement, um, but it's not like, there's no like RCTs for this. Paragonomiasis. Um, so this is a parasitic disorder. It's caused, it's endemic in Southeast Asia. It's caused by the oriental fluke and it happens after you ingest freshwater crabs. So once you ingest um, the freshwater crabs, the larvae actually migrate through your abdominal cavity, like into your pleural space and your lungs. Um, and they actually, sometimes on chest radiography, you can actually find like migration tracks where you can see the organism tracking up. And that's actually a very specific, <laughs> that's actually a very specific, um, um, uh, way of diagnosing this. But in terms of the cysts themselves, the cysts uh, occur because you have ischemic infarction because the larvae basically are obstructing like an arterial or a vein that supplies the area. Um, and so you have cysts, uh, cysts being, cysts that <laughs> you have cysts developing, which can have variable wall thickness. Um, and they can be present in areas of consolidation as well. We talked about the migration tracks. So you diagnose them uh, by serology or detection of eggs in sputum or BAL. And the method of treatment is usually pasoquantel. ILD, very big topic, just very short points on it. So the most common um, ILD processes that present with cystic lung disease are IPF, subacute and chronic HP and sarcoid. Um, it's not the dominant feature in any of them, but they can present with it. Now the presence of the, and the nature of the cysts are sometimes helpful on imaging for you to kind of sift through your differentials. So in chronic HP, the cysts are generally seen with areas of ground glass attenuation, and you can have central lobular nodules and areas of decreased lobular attenuation alongside the cyst. For cysts in IPF, these can vary from three to 10 millimeters inside. They often have more thicker fibrous walls and they usually come along with your classic fibrotic features. So traction bronchiectasis, honeycombing, um, and cyst in IPF and other ILDs usually have kind of a peripheral, subperal, and basilar predominance. Whereas if you're comparing to sarcoid, they have more of a perihyla distribution or even an upper lobe distribution. 
um, this slide is a really good kind of al algorithm to kind of help you go through your differentials. So the biggest test that that I call base, the most helpful and non-invasive tool that you will have will be your high resolution CT. So that along with your excellent history taking and physical exam is going to really help um, help with these boxes and where you're going to put things. So once you've deciphered what your clinical presentation is and now you're reviewing your CT, if you see these nice, round, smooth cysts with normal lung parenchyma, they're diffusely distributed, you're going to think of lab. And then you're going to think, well, what are my confirmatory testing that I can do for a lab, right? So you can check for TSC, you can check for VEGF levels, you can get a biopsy or tissue diagnosis. Now, if on the imaging you see lentiform, epileptical cysts, abutting the pleura and vessels in a basal predominant distribution, then you're going to think of Brihag Dubé. And you're going to scan to see if they have any renal angiolipomas. It might, if they have skin lesions, you can use a skin biopsy. You can genotype them for the folliculin gene. If they have bizarre irregular cysts along with nodules and cavities, and it's mostly upper predominant, then you're going to think of pulmonary Langerhans cell hysterocytosis. They're going to tell you they have this extensive smoking history, and you might see that they have DI, skin lesions, bone lesions, and you can confirm with a, with a tissue diagnosis, or you can genotype them. If you see these round cysts of varying size and they have these associated areas of brown glass attenuation, septal thickening, nodularity, with a very diffuse distribution, then you can think about LIP or FB, amyloid, light chain deposition, and trovans. And you're gonna elicit appropriate sy symptoms. You can do your autoimmune workup for these patients. Um, and you can also pursue tissue diagnosis in these patients. If you see a cyst pattern that's not consistent with any of the previous, then your differentials get a little wider, right? You think about ILD, you think about neoplastic process, whether primary or secondary, smoking-related um, ILDs as well. And then you tailor your kind of confirmatory tests based on this. So I thought this was a really good kind of algorithm to kind of guide you. And so that brings me to my summary slide. So there are a variety of pathophysiological processes that can present as diffuse cystic lung disease. The clinical chorus treatment and complications of them vary wide, wild, widely. And so you wanna make sure that from the onset you have the right diagnosis. Your high resolution CT remains your single most useful non-invasive diagnostic tool to evaluate these patients. And your confirmatory testing, whether by tissue or genetic analysis is recommended for cases given that imaging can have such considerable overlap. And of course, for us to be able to develop better targeted therapies, we need a better understanding of how these cysts actually form. And I wanna thank Dr. Bradley for his input on my presentation. And thank you guys, questions, comments, and your answer key also for the imaging. Yes, pretty much. They can look very similar on imaging. Um, your, so the question was for RB and DIP. Yeah, like how would you tell the difference? Um, on imaging, they can look pretty much the same. So your tissue is going to be your best bet. Um, I don't think I came across anything else. Like there's no stain that I could like kind of readily tell you off the top of my head that I can think of. Yeah, sorry, I'm so excited about that. <laughs> Like a specific, sorry? Yeah, so um, I'm trying to remember because I had a fungal, I had somebody who grew like strongoloides on their, on their BAL also. Yeah, I think, I think you would see it just on that, on the cell count. To be honest, yeah, you would see the eggs on the, yes, you would see the eggs on the lava on, yeah, on, on microscopy, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, for one more time. 
Uh-huh. It's not so much that um, the first, like their first presentation, it's the recurrence rate. The recurrence rate is like 75% and higher. So just for you to, um, the morbidity that would be associated with them coming back with recurrent pneumothorax, like early pleurodesis is really like preferred for that particular patient population. No, no, you're not prophylactic anything. No, no. Yeah. So I think they're all underreported, and I think it's because most people don't, it's not the first thing that you're going to think of, like when patients, because most of these patients, those first like three that we talked about, they generally present either with chronic dyspnea, for which if you see them in clinic, you're going to do like a full workup, right? You have time with those people or they present with a pneumothorax as their initial. And so most times that first pneumothorax is thought to be you know, spontaneous. If they can't find a reason for it, they kind of chalk it up, eh, okay. But it's on the return when they have the second or even the third that people start thinking about things more than just, um, you know, does this person have like asthma, COPD, emphysematous changes? Do they have alpha one? Like they start think broadening the differential after that. Sometimes it can be confused with emphysema with just sort of intercoronary cysts. And so, um, you know, it, it, it doesn't always flip to the top as the initial diagnosis. And so, you know, the history and the physical exam become integral pieces and, of course, multiple. something. 